Carry or support. Nuker, healer, pusher, or tank. Every hero in Dota 2 has a role. Axe goes in first, goads his opponents into attacking him, and then retaliates with powerful counter damage. And once he finds a weak spot, a momentary lapse in your guard, he mercilessly goes for the execution. Axe is the prototypical tank, an idea that he embodies straightforwardly. But was his simplicity a sign of strength or a failure in design? Today, we're going to explore Axe's impact across Dota 2 history and discover how he performed at our most important events, the International. So, how good was Mogul Khan, also known as Axe? Mogul Khan began his warpath as but an insignificant grunt in the Red Mist army. Battle after battle, he proved his worth as a warrior. Mogul quickly rose through the ranks, leaving behind a trail of bodies not only of his opponents, but also of his superiors. Battle after battle, their numbers shrunk. Soon, Mogul stood on a mountain of corpses from which he declared himself Red Mist General and took the name Axe. Battle after battle, until Axe stood alone. But this mattered not to Axe, as he knew his one-man army was still the strongest. Axe was implemented into Dota 2 during the close beta period before the first international. He was a melee strength hero with decent general attributes, the only issue was his rather low movement speed. Axe's first ability was Berserker's Call. Berserker's Call taunted nearby enemies and forced them to attack Axe for a short duration, during which he gained significant bonus armor. A taunted enemy was unable to do anything other than attack Axe. Berserker's Call had a fairly small radius, but also a low cooldown. It was a spammable AoE disabled that was great for starting fights and even allowed Axe to move melee heroes into bad spots by making them chase him as he shifted his own positioning. Berserker's Call was a strong ability, but it required Blink Dagger to function as otherwise Axe had no good way of getting close enough to his opponents to connect with it, in part because of his low natural movement speed. A curious element of Axe was that many of his abilities had weird properties. For Berserker's Call that meant that it could affect invincible enemies, like for example units caught in a cyclone from a Yule Scepter of Divinity. Axe's second ability was Battle Hunger. Battle hunger enraged an enemy unit, making them first for carnage. A unit affected by battle hunger took magic damage every second and was slowed. Battle hunger lasted for a lengthy duration, but it could be ended early if the unit affected killed another unit. In theory, this ability could deal a lot of damage if it lasted for its full duration, but it could also be cancelled immediately. Battle Hunger was a bit odd, as it had one major glaring issue. When was the best time to use this? During the laning stage, there were plenty of creeps around to be killed to instantly cancel the effect, and afterwards its damage and slow were too low to be significant. It just wasn't a particularly good ability. Battle Hunger's weird quirk was that it couldn't be dispelled in any other way than killing something. Axe's third and signature ability was Counter Helix. Counter Helix was a passive ability that gave Axe a 17% chance to respond to an incoming attack with a powerful counter that dealt a set amount of physical damage to all nearby enemies. This trigger had a short cooldown, limiting how often Counter Helix could deal damage. Counter Helix worked great with Berserker's Call as it required enemies to attack Axe and Berserker's Call forced them to. 
It was also an excellent farming tool, as Axe could tank a couple of creeps and then spin them down. However, a closer look at Counter Helix reveals quite a few strange elements. Its trigger didn't happen when Axe was hit by an attack, but instead when an attack was started. For most purposes, this made little difference, but occasionally, Axe could kill somebody for an attack that they never managed to launch. Counter Helix also didn't affect Siege Creeps, even though it was a physical ability which usually bypassed magic immunity. And finally, but most bizarrely of all, Counter Helix's damage was reduced by damage block. This was by no means usual. There were plenty of other physical damage spells and they weren't reduced by damage block. While Counter Helix did have a use for farming creeps, against heroes it was one of the worst abilities in the game purely because it couldn't deal damage through the single most commonly bought items on melee heroes. Stout Shield, a cheap early game item which provided damage block, wasn't optional. Every melee hero bought Stout Shield in every game. It was the only way to not get destroyed by ranged heroes and creep damage during the laning stage. Stout Shield also had two incredibly common upgrade options in Poor Man's Shield and Vanguard that were both excellent. Stout Shield was such an essential component of Dota 2 that eventually it got deleted as an item and turned into a passive core mechanic of every single melee hero. Counter Helix having its damage reduced by damage block was a death sentence to its viability. Axe's ultimate was Cunning Blade. For Cunning Blade, Axe waited patiently until he spotted weakness in his opponents and then he struck, instantly killing them if their health was below a certain threshold. Cunning Blade was a melee range spell that dealt magic damage to an enemy hero. This damage was fairly low, but if that enemy hero had less than a specific amount of health, then they died instantly. This skill threshold was higher than Culling Blade's damage. Interestingly, Culling Blade didn't do damage if its skill threshold was met. Instead, it simply declared the target dead. This allowed Axe to bypass protection effects, most famously Dazzle's Shallow Grave, which protected a hero from death and kept them at a minimum of one health. Culling Blade cut right through Shallow Grave, killing the hero regardless. Culling Blade was fully blocked by magic immunity, but for some reason bypassed Lincoln's Sphere. It also had an Aghanim Scepter upgrade that reduced its cooldown to 10 seconds. Culling Blade was terrible. It did nothing until the target was already basically dead, at which point Axe could use it to steal the kill. Overall, Axe was awful. He was meant to blink in, taunt with Berserker's Call, then deal damage with Counter Helix and finally finish the kill with Culling Blade. But Counter Helix and Culling Blade were worthless abilities, so the entire concept couldn't work. His only redeeming quality was Berserker's Call. But why pick him for that alone when Tidehunter or Beastmaster existed who had way better disables that were also easier to use? The International 1 wasn't a particularly well-balanced tournament. But nonetheless, every hero got a chance to shine for at least one game, simply because there weren't that many heroes available. A pool of only 46 characters didn't leave many options. Except that even in that environment, Axe was too horrid for anyone to bother. Vanguard and Pullman's shield were staples of the tournament and so Counter Helix couldn't do any damage. He was the only hero to go unpicked at the first international. However, he was banned twice, putting him ahead of a variety of other characters. But I have an unfortunate theory regarding those bans. TI1 was played on an unstable version of Dota and crashes and disconnects weren't unusual. In both games in which Axe was banned, the draft went by very quickly. As in, neither team used a single second of their bonus time. Their bans were also, let's say, unusual. I believe that these two games were rehosts, 
and that the teams simply recreated the picks from their previous lobby which had probably crashed and while doing so they were banning random heroes. So while Axe was strictly speaking banned twice, I will have to subtract two bans from that leaving him as the only uncontested hero. There was absolutely no reason to pick Axe, he was by far the worst hero in the game. After this uh, performance, Axe was buffed in a variety of different ways. Berserker's Call had its cooldown reduced to only 10 seconds, which made it much more spammable than before. Battle Hunger gained a new property, now giving Axe a small bit of bonus movement speed for each enemy affected by it. Counter Edix had its damage increased and cooldown reduced, which certainly helped but didn't fix the issue at hand, being that it was still reduced by damage block. The biggest changes came to Culling Blade. It gained a new property that had Axe Anisha Warcry in a rather small 600 radius if we killed an enemy hero with it. Allies affected by the Warcry had their movement speed increased by 25% for 6 seconds. The Aghanim Scepter cooldown for Culling Blade was also reduced to 6 seconds. In theory, Axe could now permanently apply this Warcry bonus by getting kills with Culling Blade repeatedly as its cooldown finished. But Culling Blade was still absolutely terrible, making this, at best, an incoherent fever dream. No wonder the Red Mist army ran out of soldiers if this was their leader. At least Axe gained a bit of bonus intelligence and had his base health regeneration increase to 2. This last change was actually quite nice as it offered Axe a good amount of bonus staying power during the laning stage. Axe was only chosen during a single game at the International 2, during the group stages match between CLG and Zenith. Here Axe was likely picked as a counter to Broodmother and Chen, both of which were summon based heroes that relied on an army of units to fight. Counter Helix was great against multiple units and especially creeps and so Axe made sense. He could spin down the summons and hopefully do some significant amount of damage along the way. Axe started the game in the jungle. He wasn't a particularly good jungler because nobody except for summon based heroes like Enigma or Chen were good junglers. The jungle creeps were simply too powerful for most heroes to take on by themselves during the early game. However, Counter Helix was certainly a distinguishing factor while farming, meaning Axe was competent at killing specifically the small jungle camps, as those often spawn with a multitude of units. But as soon as he had to take on medium or big camps, he struggled in the same way that everybody else did. And so, despite being a jungler, Axe didn't actually spend that much time in the jungle. He only invested a single point into Counter Helix and instead he maxed out Battle Hunger, which he then used to try to gank. At first this didn't work particularly well, as his only opportunity during the early game went to waste as the enemy morphling simply lasted a creep to immediately end the debuff. Still, a few minutes later Axe actually had his dream opportunity, as he managed to catch out both Storm Spirit and Broodmother with no creeps around for them to end battle hunger prematurely. This will remain his only successful gank, as the game turned into a farming match and both teams tried to win with their carries. Given that win condition, Axe immediately fell behind, as he had no way of keeping up. His item build ended up being a weird amalgamation of whatever he could afford before big fights. Trankle Boots, a lone energy booster, Vanguard and Ghost Scepter? The only really good item he ever bought was Blink Dagger, which enabled him to teleport into fights and initiate them by landing effective Berserker's calls. However, at the time Blink Dagger cost 75 mana to use and as such strength heroes often struggled to maintain enough mana for all of their abilities. This was likely the reason for that sad, unupgraded energy booster which provided nothing other than mana. For the rest of the game, Axe tried his best to be an initiator. He would go in first and taunt high priority targets which then allowed his team to kill them. At least that was the theory. In reality, Axe was often less than effective. 
At 49 minutes into their match, Zenith were pushing bottom, but then retreated as they wanted to avoid a fight. However, when CLG started chasing, Axe decided to blink in. As Berserker's call was cast, despite other heroes being fairly close nearby, it only hit Morphling due to its small radius. During his 3 second taunt duration, Axe did no damage and was immediately pummeled halfway to death and then Tidehunter cast his ultimate and showed what a real initiator looked like, stunning 4 of Cena's heroes and killing Axe in the process. Axe's blink call was usually just a 3 second suicide stun. While he could live for the duration of his armor buff, Afterwards, he had nothing to defend himself and the idea of ever using his ultimate effectively was delusional. Zenith ended up winning this game, but not because of Axe. Instead, their initiation game was carried by Darkseer and Disruptor, who made up for having an Axe on their team. Axe couldn't farm, Axe couldn't deal damage and Axe couldn't even survive his own initiation if he ever landed it. He was a one-man army but only because nobody wanted to work with him. Axe was a really, really bad hero. After this pathetic performance, Axe received a couple of minor buffs. Berserker's Core's bonus armor was increased from 30 to 40, Battle Hunger gained a new property where it now gave Axe bonus movement speed as well as slowing the opponent, and Counter Helix had its damage increased and cooldown reduced. Attentive viewer that you are, I'm confident you noticed that this didn't address any of Axe's issues and as a result he was yet again only picked once at the International 3 by Virtus Pro in their group stages match against LGD International. Axe played a jungling role again, but instead of trying to gank he focused on pulling creeps to help his safe lane Queen of Pain. This wasn't particularly necessary, as Queen of Pain was already a strong laner and she could easily take on the opposing Beastmaster by herself, but nonetheless it was beneficial to her. He skilled Battlehunger first again, but this time he even managed to secure an early kill using it. Things were looking alright, but then his second gank didn't go so well. And then he got ganked himself. Axe's main contribution during the early game ended up being that he was such an easy target to kill that he made for good bait, allowing Virtus Pro to turn some fights into their favor. Other than that, Axe didn't really do anything. Look at this push from 20 minutes into the game. Even Virtus Pro decided that they don't need Axe as he's nowhere to be seen. At least Axe had more items this time around, as he spent much more time farming. He went Trankles, Vanguard, Cloak, Blade Mail, Blink Dagger. The goal was to maximize his survivability so he doesn't immediately die after an initiation. This worked, in a way, I guess, because he failed to land any initiations. He did still die though, as he was slowly worn down in fights by stray damage while not contributing anything himself. But regardless of his own performance, Axe's team excelled in this match and in its closing moments, Axe landed the greatest initiation I have ever seen. Despite Axe missing literally everything, his team won the fight afterwards as LGD couldn't stop themselves from taking the easy kill on Axe and as a result ended up out of position and were freely picked off by the rest of Virtus Pro. At TI3, Axe continued to be one of the worst heroes in the game. The only thing he contributed in his single game of the tournament was being accidental bait as LGD couldn't stop themselves from killing him whenever they saw the opportunity. Other than that, Virtus Pro could probably have played 4 vs 5 and done just as well, if not better. I hope you have been enjoying the video. If you have, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. That would really help out a lot. We only upload once a month and we need all the assistance we can get for that one upload. And yeah, that's it. Let's get back to it. Clearly, the current iteration of Axe wasn't working. Patch 6.79 brought a huge number of changes to the hero. Berserker's Call had its AoE slightly increased, making it a bit stronger as a fight opener. Battlehunger had its damage and duration reduced, 
and became dispellable, but in turn its slow and movement speed bonus were slightly increased. Counter Helix had its cooldown reduced by 0.1 of a second and it now dealt damage to siege units. Finally, Cutting Blade received a soft rework. The movement speed buff Cutting Blade applied was increased to 40% and its AoE was boosted to 900. It now also applied a 40 attack speed bonus. Its kill threshold was reduced, but Aghanim Scepter now increased it back to its old value and increased the duration of the kill buff to 10 seconds. Most importantly though, Culling Blade had its mana cost reduced and no longer went on cooldown if Axe successfully killed a hero with it. In theory, he could now Culling Blade to get a kill, then Culling Blade again for another and continue dunking his way through the entire enemy team. In 6.80, Axe had his base health regeneration increased from 2 to 3, and Berserker's Call had its duration increased but its cooldown nerfed at early levels. Finally, in 6.81, Counter Helix started using pseudo random chance. Up until this point, Counter Helix had been one of the few truly random abilities in Dota. This meant that whenever Axe was attacked, he had a 17% chance of triggering Counter Helix. This was unusual. Most abilities used pseudo random chance instead. A pseudo random chance is one that starts out lower than the desired value and then increases every time the desired event doesn't happen. Here's a graph from the Dota wiki. The point of a pseudo random chance is to make it less likely for an event to happen multiple times in a row or not at all, and instead to even out that curve so it happens more frequently than expected. For Counter Helix, a 17% chance meant it should occur once every 6 attacks. But in a true random distribution, it is possible for the spin to happen 3 times in a row and then not at all for 15 attacks. While the same can still happen in a pseudo random distribution, it's much less likely and instead the spin is more probable to trigger on the 5th to 7th attack, making the ability feel more appropriately random. For its first 4 years, Dota 2 only underwent smaller balance changes, as Valve were preoccupied with porting all of the missing heroes from Warcraft 3 Dota. While the meta still shifted and changed, those changes stemmed less from patches defining the direction of the game and instead from players deciphering the best way to play and use the new heroes. Pushing as a primary strategy had always been a major component during the previous tournaments but at the International Four, it became the driving force of the best teams. They shortened the laning phase, only farming for long enough to get a few basic items and then they started breaking towers wherever they could. Collecting the loaded tower bounties allowed aggressive teams to run away with the game before any traditional carry would have had the chance to farm enough gold to be relevant in fights. Games at the International Four regularly lasted less than 20 minutes, a brutally punishing short amount of time. Given this environment, Axe never stood a chance. If he wanted any relevance at all, he absolutely had to spend a bit of time farming to gather Blink Dagger and a defensive item. As lackluster as Axe's initiation was with Blink Dagger, without it he literally couldn't do anything. And as low as Axe's survivability was with Vanguard, without it he died instantly. Axe had absolutely no tools to stop the aggressive pushing strategies of TI4 and he offered nothing to participate in them. He was yet again truly awful, but he did manage to be part of an all-time Dota history record. This record happened during the second game between Cloud9 and Team DK. In this match, Axe played the mid. At first he managed to hold his own. But as the opposing Ember Spirit leveled up and gained access to his powerful abilities, Axe couldn't do much anymore. While this was going on, the Radiant safe lane went uncontested. Understandably, Cloud9 felt like they had to do something about DK's Lycan farming up for free and so Axe went into the bottom lane to apply some pressure, but he immediately got destroyed. Team DK then started pushing, First the bottom two outer towers, then the same in the mid. Cloud9 realized that their chances at victory were rapidly dwindling and as DK retreated from the mid tier 2 area, Cloud9 initiated with Clockwork and Axe. However, 
they had no way to actually get a kill, and so Clockwork was forced to retreat while Axe simply died. Given that the Radiant were still in good shape and the Dyer just horribly misplayed, DK decided to push the mid barracks and Cloud9 conceded at only 11 minutes and 14 seconds of game time. This was the shortest TI game in Dota history, a record that is unlikely to ever be broken. 4 picks, 0% win rate, terrible, terrible performance in all games. Please, stop picking Axe. The hero was so bad, he was completely unusable. Following the International Four, Dota's economy was reworked to be less about pushing towers and more about fighting heroes and farming creeps. This was a blessing for Axe, and it was only one amongst many. Patch 6.82 added a new item, Crimson Guard. Crimson Guard was built out of a Vanguard and a Buckler. It provided the combined stats of the items, making it a great item for enhancing physical defense. Crimson Guard also had an active ability that applied a 9 second buff on all nearby allied heroes that gave them a 100% chance to block 50 physical damage. Crimson Guard was a great item for heroes that were looking to tank attacks, as it not only enhanced their own survivability greatly, but also protected their team. This made it a solid choice for Axe, as it worked well with his specific style of initiation, but of course an opposing Crimson Guard would completely nullify all damage Axe could ever do, making it more of an issue at first than a benefit. But I think you can already guess where this is headed. Battle Hunger was changed to always have a static duration of 10 seconds, but its damage per second was greatly enhanced. While its overall potential damage output was lower, in most realistic scenarios, it was much more capable of dealing that damage. Berserker's Cold and had its cast point increased and it was changed to no longer affect invincible units and to end if Axe died before the effect ran out. Culling Blade had its kill threshold reduced and movement speed and attack speed bonus upon kill reduced. Counter Edicts also had its chance increased to 20% and it now triggered when an attacker landed rather than when it started. Most importantly though, Counter Helix no longer had its damage reduced by damage block. It may have taken 5 years, but Axe could finally, actually deal damage. The International 5 was a drastically different tournament from what had come before it. Pushing wasn't as important anymore and instead teams fought over the resources available in their respective jungles, while putting big emphasis on trying to steal the opponent's stacked camps. Axe found a home in this new environment as a strong laner that excelled against specific heroes. Axe usually played a solo lane, although he was given consideration by his team when picking which lane that was. He was essentially an offlaner, but he wasn't forced to play the hardest lane in the match. Instead, his team would accommodate him by freeing up the safe lane for him through an aggressive tri lane or a dual mid, which applied pressure and lessened the burden on Axe. Axe was resilient in lane, due to his incredibly high starting health regeneration of 3.8. That much regeneration allowed him to comfortably survive if he played defensively, and if he wanted to trade hits, all he had to do was keep a steady supply of tangos going. Given that and some occasional support, Axe could comfortably hold his own during laning, as counter helix represented a significant threat to anyone that got too close to him. And yes, counter helix was finally a powerful ability that actually mattered, and so Axe now leveled it as his primary spell, keeping battle hunger to only a single point and then maxing out Berserker's Call second. This also allowed him to pivot into farming the jungle should the lane go sour. Early jungle farming still wasn't particularly effective, but Axe was better at it than most, and as such he had a backup option other heroes lacked. Axe was primarily used as a counterpick to specific other heroes. He was good against Dazzle and summon based characters. During Empire vs MVP Hot 6, Axe played a solo offlane against Broodmother. By 10 minutes he had 120 creep kills, an absurd amount only made possible because he kept killing her spiderlings. 
he bullied her out of lane and maintained complete control without worry. And against Dazzle, he dunked through Shallowgrave. This may seem like a small niche, but Shallowgrave was an incredibly valuable ability and being able to bypass it could change the tide of an entire teamfight. Dazzle and Broodmother were both very powerful heroes and so Axe being a strong counter to them was a legitimate niche. As a solo laner, Axe rushed Blink Dagger, often getting it before 10 minutes, which then allowed him to set his team up for early aggression. Blink in, Berserker's call, pray for some spins, and then, hopefully, dunk, ideally repeatedly, until the enemy team is dead. During the early and mid game, Axe could apply significant pressure that built momentum towards a fast victory. Finally, a unique property of Axe started to manifest itself. While Berserker's Call was a much weaker initiation tool than other similar abilities, it also only had a cooldown of 10 seconds. This hadn't mattered up until now, because Axe had been so terrible that any positive qualities he may have had were overshadowed by his inability to do anything. But now that Axe was reasonably powerful, the fact that his initiation cooldown was mainly dependent on Blink Dagger's cooldown was a unique selling point. Other heroes relied on long cooldown ultimates to start fights, which needed to land well the first and only time they were used. But as long as Axe survived, he could keep blinking in and casting Berserker's Call over and over again. The only limiting factors were his health and mana, and luckily by now Blink Dagger no longer cost mana to use. A farmed axe was very annoying to deal with in long fights. However, most fights weren't all that long. If an initiator did their job well, then the fight was over in seconds. This was especially true during TI5, as the most popular heroes of the tournament were Le Shrug, Gyrocopter and Queen of Pain, all of which specialized in big AoE burst damage that instantly cut through a team given the right setup. During Cloud9 vs Team Secret, the best initiator in the game was Magnus with his powerful reverse polarity. And the second best was Rubik, stealing Magnus's ultimate. Berserker's Call just wasn't as impactful as those more impressive abilities. Partially because its radius was too small and partially because it wasn't a stun, Axe actually had to tank and often he couldn't. While his early power was noteworthy, once the game got to the later stages he usually fell behind. Because Axe was picked as his team's primary playmaker, he wasn't given the luxury of dedicated farming time and so he often struggled to maintain competitive net worth. This meant he couldn't buy the items he needed to be tanky and then Berserker's Call became a suicide button. During Secret vs E-Home, Sai, who had been struggling on Axe all game, bought a Ghost Scepter to survive his own Berserker's Call duration because he couldn't tank the opposing carry's attacks. However, this also meant that he disabled his own counter helix since it couldn't proc if he couldn't be attacked due to being ethereal. Not that counter helix would have mattered anyway. Counter helix's damage was no longer reduced by damage block and so it certainly was powerful during the early game. However, it remained a physical damage ability. Physical damage abilities always fell off hard as armor was naturally purchased and acquired throughout the match. Axe just didn't do any damage late game. Once his enemies had gathered some armor, he was completely powerless to apply any pressure by himself. At that point he spiraled into his old state of uselessness. No damage, no dunks, no kills, no money, no tanking items. No chance. At the International 5, Axe was picked 6 times. He only won 2 of those games and remained a largely unimpressive hero. But Axe wasn't that far away anymore. The unique characteristics he brought to the table were quite distinct and all he needed was a bit more reliability and long-term power. Luckily for Axe, that was exactly what he was about to be gifted. Patch 6.86 added Iron Talon. Iron Talon was a cheap early game item costing only 500 gold that had an active effect that dealt damage to a creep equal to 40% of its current health and only had a 14 second cooldown. 
Iron Talon was an incredibly powerful item for killing jungle creeps. It's no exaggeration to say that Iron Talon revolutionized how the jungle was played. At TI5, stacking camps to large sizes and then nuking them down with powerful AoE spells was the fastest way to farm. But it was also risky, as those stacks were frequently contested by the enemy team. Iron Talon enabled a much wider cast of heroes to kill hard and medium jungle camps early in the game, and as such teams moved away from the riskier stacking strategies. Patch 6.87 then brought the final missing piece. Counter Helix had its damage slightly reduced, but its damage type was changed to pure. Pure damage wasn't reduced by armor or magic resistance. Now unobstructed by any resistances, Counter Helix would always do a respectable amount of damage no matter how long the game went. At the International 2016, Axe finally got a chance to dominate. He continued playing as a strong solo laning core, although which lane exactly depended on where he could find the best opportunities to use Counter Helix. In particular, Axe was overwhelming against other melee heroes. If he positioned himself in the center of a creep wave and intentionally pulled creep aggro when his opponent entered into counter helix range, then the creeps would attack him and trigger counter helix which inflicted significant harm on his opponents. Since counter helix was a passive ability without a cost or significant cooldown and due to his high natural health region, Axe could trade hits with his opponents non-stop, easily winning the lane. When Wings picked Axe against DC in the Grand Finals, they placed Axe in the mid where he made the lane a living hell for the opposing Slark, even forcing DC to completely change their laning setup by moving Miranda mid and Slark top. Rotations like this always resulted in a significant loss of resources and were only done when absolutely necessary. Against melee heroes, Axe was an incredibly mean lane bully. He didn't have a specific lane he played and instead he went wherever he could cause the most damage. However, against ranged heroes, Axe struggled. As powerful as Counter Helix was, it also was a melee range ability. Occasionally, he found himself in games without a good lane available to him. But thanks to Iron Talon, even that wasn't a problem, as Axe could use it to become a genuine, proper jungler. He could start farming jungle camps from the start of the game at level 1 and maintain very good pace with the rest of the match. During OG vs MEP Phoenix, Foref started the game in the jungle and by 7 minutes he was top net worth out of all heroes. Jungling was still dangerous though as it left Axe wide open to ganks and weakened his team's laning structure, but it also meant that Axe couldn't end up in a bad lane. Even if his team was completely outdrafted and there was no lane where Axe stood the slightest chance, he could always head into the jungle and be fine. Axe offered reliability. Axe spent most of his income on Blink Dagger and then on an item that we hadn't seen too much of until now, Blade Mail. Blade Mail cost 2200 gold, provided some minor stats and had a powerful active ability. When activated, Blade Mail gave its user a buff for 4.5 seconds that duplicated any damage they took and returned it to whoever was stealing it. If Lion was to use a Finger of Death on Axe with Blade Mail active, then Axe would still take the damage, but so would Lion. The same was true for attacks, which made it synergistic with Berserker's Call forcing opponents to attack Axe. The idea was that Axe would blink in Berserker's Call, Blade Mail, and then they would die to their own damage. However, up until patch 6.87, blade mail hadn't been functional because the damage being returned was reduced by resistances before being returned. If Axe used Berserker's Call, then his armor was massively increased for the duration, which minimized the actual health he lost when being attacked. Before 6.87, Blade Mail only returned damage based on the actual HP Axe lost, which wasn't much because of Berserker's Call. But in 6.87, Blade Mail was changed to return damage before reductions. Now, 
Axe could force his opponents to effectively attack themselves by taunting them and then activating blade mail, returning the entirety of their own damage while he himself was protected by bonus armor. Blade mail also fit perfectly into Axe's naturally fast-paced rhythm as its cooldown was only 13 seconds. The item immediately became the second most common choice on the hero, only surpassed by Blink Dagger. With Blade Mail and the new Counter Helix, Axe became a bomb. He blinked in, taunted with Berserker Skull, activated Blade Mail, and then prayed that his target died before he did. Berserker Skull was Axe's most important ability. It defined his entire purpose within a team's structure. Axe was an initiator with a much lower cooldown compared to other similar heroes. While Berserker Skull didn't have the impact of a Ravage or a Reverse Polarity, it was available much more frequently. This allowed Axe to be incredibly disruptive in long fights where he got to blink Cole repeatedly. As this required him to survive the initial assault, he was often paired with those more impressive initiators who would lead the charge and then Axe would follow up on vulnerable targets. Look at this fight between EG and E Home. Axe hung out in the back, keeping his distance and waiting for an opportunity. As his allied Faceless Void jumped in, he followed up with a Berserker's Call on Timbersaw to prevent him from casting spells. He then safely disengaged as Berserker's Call ran out, healed up, and came back to fight again. He landed another valuable call, and with that, EG managed to defend. Low cooldown, repeated initiations that drained his opponents off their resources and distracted them away from his own team's carries was his main game plan, although that required him to survive long enough to pull it off. The biggest problem Axe had was his inability to tank his own initiation if his opponents were too strong. During this fight between Escape and Fnatic, Axe was the top farmer on his team. He had been doing well. However, the opposing Templar assassin was still far ahead of him. The fight started and Escape got a nice opening kill on Tidehunter. But Axe got pummeled by Templar assassin and quickly dropped to low health. As the fight continued afterwards, Axe was left unable to contribute as he didn't have enough health to Berserker's Call again and he had no notable long-range abilities. Fnatic ended up winning the fight and took down the mid barracks as a result. This was by no means unusual. Axe frequently initiated only to be killed. While Berserker's Call offered some protection from physical damage, it left Axe wide open to any magic thrown his way, and because of its small radius, Axe wouldn't usually be able to taunt more than one hero at a time. As already alluded to, Axe's initiation was still often a suicide initiation. It really can't be overstated how much worse having to actually tank attacks was, compared to simply stunning his targets the way much of Axe's competition did. Axe was a contradiction in design. He was meant to be an initiator that made up for his less powerful opening salvo by going in again and again and again. However, he didn't have the survivability needed for this approach. That's where Blade Mail came in, making sure that even if Axe died, he dealt significant damage before going down. But of course, that didn't solve the actual problem of Axe dying. It just made it more palatable. This is also why teams were playing with two initiators. Axe was commonly accompanied by another initiator with a huge ultimate, like Kunkka, Naga Siren or Faceless Void. One hero for the big place and an Axe who traded his life for a moment of disable and some good damage. The crux of the problem actually had little to do with Axe's style of initiation, which was unique and effective enough when considering its low cooldown. But I'm sure you've noticed that I've only been talking about Berserker's Call and Counter Helix. The real problem was that his two other abilities were effectively useless. Battlehunger was alright during the early game as it could deal good damage and provided a valuable slow, but since Axe had to level up his other two spells first, it never got to shine during its window of opportunity. Cutting Blade on the other hand was just awful and contributed little of worth. Together, these two abilities offered no survivability, no significant damage and no substantial utility. Axe felt like a hero with only two abilities. 
On that note, for his concept to work, Cunning Blade really should heal Axe when he got a kill, but either way. At the International 6, Axe was given the chance to dominate, and instead he was usually the least impactful core on his team. However, despite that, Axe was a popular hero choice, being contested in 67 games, 42% of the tournament, and with a solid 54% win rate. That's because, despite Axe's shortcomings, he was a very dependable hero. Axe only needed Blink Dagger to be able to contribute, and after he finished his blade mail, he could usually trade his life for a kill. There's a floor for how badly a hero can perform given the worst possible scenario and a ceiling for their perfect game given the best case scenario. For carries, the floor and the ceiling were often very far apart, but for supports they were closer. Even in their worst games, the support would still do alright, but then in their best case scenario they couldn't do as much as a carry would be able to. For Axe, the floor and the ceiling were pretty much the same. While landing his initiation usually wasn't game winning, Axe did often manage to throw out at least two Berserker's cores, and even if he was killed right away, because he had blade mail and counter helix, he likely damaged at least one opposing hero enough for them to be significantly harmed. Because of his strong laning presence and good natural farming speed, Axe was also always able to get both items at a good timing. Axe was dependable. Any team that picked him knew exactly what they were getting and he did what he promised very well. His laning flexibility also meant that he could fill holes left in a draft and that meant that there wasn't really a bad moment to pick Axe. An early pick gave nothing away and a late pick fixed problems. He was… fine. I know that's not a roaring endorsement, but surprisingly often, that's all the team needed. A hero that was guaranteed to be fine. And that was Axe, a mercenary that just put in the hours. Following TI6, Axe had his counter helix damage reduced at early levels, significantly weakening his early laning power, and Blade Mail had its cooldown increased to 18 seconds, which now didn't line up with the cooldowns of Blink Dagger and Berserker's Call anymore. While at first glance, these may seem like minor changes, they hit Axe exactly where it hurt. But before Valve could give this any more thought, Dota 7.0 was released and with it any chances of revisiting old issues vanished for the next couple of months. In 7.0, Axe received a mediocre talent tree. In a vacuum, a lot of his talents were actually quite strong, like his plus 3 mana regeneration at level 10 or plus 75 damage at level 15. But they unfortunately didn't do anything Axe needed. He needed survivability and two more usable spells, and in that regard his talent tree offered him little of value. Patch 7.06 included a rework of Axe's Aghanim Scepter. It now caused Battlehunger to reduce the damage of the affected unit by 30%, and if Axe landed a successful culling blade, then Battlehunger was automatically applied to all enemy heroes within a 700 AoE. The 30% damage reduction was certainly nice to have. However, Axe was generally much better off just buying actual survivability instead of spending that money on an Aghanim Scepter. And the second line might as well not have existed, as it required Axe to successfully use Culling Blade, which was nearly impossible. Axe also had his strength gain increased and base health regeneration reduced. Another unfortunate nerf to his early game. And the final kick in the face was another increase to Blade Mail's cooldown, now going up to 20 seconds. Not much change for Axe at the International 7. He was still the same, a little weaker, but not drastically so. Still, the same wasn't true for the rest of the hero pool. Many characters have been granted powerful new tools in 7.0 and its following patches. Those heroes now stood on top of the tournament. Axe hadn't received the same blessings, and while he maintained his reliability, he did so at a lower power level compared to before and that made him more niche. Nonetheless, he saw limited play. In the right lane, Axe continued to be the meanest bully. During LGD vs Liquid, Eleven on Axe forced Matumba Man on Lycan to completely skip his walls until he could get away from Axe, as they would only have resulted in even more counter helix spins. However, as the game continued, Axe faded into irrelevance. 
Team Liquid's magic damage, in particular coming from Ember Spirit, was too much for him to handle. This outcome repeated itself across his other games. A strong laning performance followed by a lackluster mid to late game. Still, given the right circumstances, Axe could blink in and suicide kill the enemy carry. He did so a couple of times during LFI vs Newbie, as he focused the enemy Morphling who couldn't tank his own damage. Axe successfully killed Morphling twice at crucial moments, the first giving his team an opportunity to take Roshan and Barracks, and the second letting them solidify the advantage and secure the victory. However, this was a best case scenario. Much more frequently, Axe blinked in, did some damage and then died. He wasn't a terrible hero, but he also didn't offer much power. 8 picks, 5 wins. Axe was chosen when his team needed a laner that could handle himself. And like a true professional, Axe didn't do a single damn thing more than what he was being paid for. Patch 7.07 .07 reworked Axe's talent tree into something a bit more suitable. An interesting talent inclusion was the attacking proc counter helix talent at level 20. With it, Axe could trigger counter helix proactively by attacking. Counter helix had always suffered from being an entirely reactive ability. While Axe could force his opponents to attack him, when that wasn't an option, he had no way of applying pressure, since counter helix was most of his damage. And if he wasn't being attacked, counter helix couldn't trigger. This talent changed that and it let Axe be less reliant on Berserker's core. In theory, it could also work well with his high attack speed talent at level 10. But the attacking proc's counter helix talent only became available at level 20, which was unfortunately too late for Axe to use it effectively. 7.07 .07 also increased Axe's base health regeneration to 4.25 as part of the regeneration rework. Axe now had a starting health regeneration of 5, an absurdly high amount. Harassing Axe during laning felt futile, as he would quickly heal any damage dealt to him without even using any consumables. Unfortunately, 7.07 .07 wasn't all good news. Iron Talon was removed from the game. One of the big reasons why Axe was worth considering over the past two tournaments was his laning flexibility, and that stemmed in significant part from Iron Talon. Iron Talon allowed Axe to treat the jungle as a reliable source of income if his lane didn't work out. And without it, he now faced the possibility of getting pressured out of a lane without anywhere else to go. It also slowed down his farming in successful lanes, as quickly dipping into the jungle for a couple extra last hits became more difficult. Other than that, Axe only received a couple of minor changes, the most noteworthy one being his base armor being reduced by one. At the International 8, Axe had vanished. While everybody else was becoming more and more powerful, he was left behind. Who would hire a mercenary that couldn't win a fight? The first call to action came from Invictus Gaming during their group stages match against OG. Looking at the hero selection of both teams, Axe seemed like an obvious choice to go up against OG's Centaur Warrunner, but that would have pushed IG's Gyrocopter into the offlane, a risky proposition. Instead, Axe decided to break the rules of laning and started the game past OG's tier 1 tower in the bottom lane. He made no attempt at laning fairly. By positioning himself far ahead of where the creeps would normally clash, Axe could catch the opposing creep wave early and easily kill it with counter helix. This was called creep skipping. Creep skipping was quite dangerous, as it exposed Axe to damage from the creep wave as well as damage from opposing heroes, and he had no safe tower to fall back to. It could also only be done starting with the second creep wave, as the first creep wave would not aggro onto other units before clashing in lane. However, creep skipping also applied immense pressure on the opposing lane, as they had to balance trying to chase away Axe with somehow last hitting creeps underneath their own tower. On top of that, Axe freely farmed literally every single creep in the wave, and he often had enough time between waves to dip into the jungle to farm camps. Creep skipping had always been a possibility for Axe, but for a variety of reasons, it hadn't been worthwhile. When playing against Trilanes, Axe would have gotten harassed out of position without much trouble, as free heroes attacking him was simply too much to handle and he couldn't be given proper backup from his team as they needed to reinforce their own Trilane. But by TI8, 
Trilanes happened faced out and only rarely saw play. Now he would only go up against two heroes, and he could be given a support if he needed it. Creep skipping was also dangerous because Axe was always tanking significant damage just from the creep wave alone. However, 7.07 .07 had given him immense starting health regeneration, which allowed him to heal enough between tanking the waves that the damage became negligible. The final and most significant problem was that many lanes could just deal with Axe creep skipping. They were able to adequately tank or clear their own creep wave and often also pressured Axe enough that he was quickly forced away. Particularly problematic were lanes with two long range heroes that could harass Axe from outside of his threat range. Creep skipping had only seen very limited play at TI, but here IG noticed that none of the risk factors were in play and they took the gamble. It worked. Axe and his support Rubik completely overwhelmed their lane and by 7 minutes Axe had 83 creep kills compared to the next highest which was 35. By 10 minutes he was leading the net worth chart by almost 2000 gold, an insane start. Unfortunately this lead faded away quickly as OG played better in fights and pressured the rest of IG enough that Axe found himself with nothing to do. While IG lost this game, their proof of concept worked, which was evidenced when Windstrike tried the same in their respective groups match against OG. Axe creep skipped, built a huge lead, and this time he successfully carried his team in a relentless assault that overwhelmed OG in only 24 minutes. Windstrike were not expected to beat OG and were quickly eliminated afterwards. Them dominatingly beating such a highly respected team should have drawn more attention, but it was largely lost in viewers memeing about OG intentionally throwing. And so the rest of the tournament passed Axe by, until OG found themselves in the grand finals going up against PSG LGD. It's game 4. If OG lose here, they are out of the tournament, eliminated in second place. As the draft finishes, OG last pick Axe. In the post-draft interview, PSG LGD's coach is not impressed. He has no faith in Axe. Well, for their draft, they lack damage in the early game, so and they depend on the on Invoker for their tempo controlling. I think it's pretty average. The game starts, and Zeb, playing Axe, does what was previously done to him and his team. He creep skips. And yet again, it works excellently. Seb dominates his lane and builds a huge lead. But the rest of OG aren't doing as well. They are struggling. Seb starts fighting and he manages to help OG stay in the match as he earns them some minor victories. But ultimately LGD are still set to maintain their momentum as their carries are well positioned. But OG won't go out like that. The supporting duo of Jerax and Notaire stand behind Seb as they enable and heal him. The three of them fight with ferocity. From here it's a competitive back and forth match with both teams showing why they made it to the grand finals, why they were the best teams this year. However, slowly but surely PSG LGD build a lead. They win better fights, they take Roshan and they find more farm on their carries. By 41 minutes, those small advantages accumulate enough for PSG LGD to claim OG's mid barracks. While OG are hanging in, they are now distinctly on the back foot and are facing elimination. Then, tragedy strikes. Ana is caught in the mid. OG need their Phantom Lancer. Without him, they stand no chance. They are forced to sacrifice two heroes just to keep him alive. OG do their best to stall, but the top barracks goes down nonetheless. They continue to struggle and hold on to their tournament lives with every fiber of their being. They had a hard journey to even get to this point, being moments away from losing important matches multiple times, only hanging in through their unrelenting tenacity and a healthy dose of good luck. We are now 53 minutes into the match. Axe is struggling. His damage has become inconsequential and even with Berserker's call active, he can only tank for a few seconds. However, Ana has found the resources he needed. 
Phantom Lancer is a nightmare and led by his charge, OG managed to kill Morphling and then take down five of PSG LGD's barracks. A couple moments later, OG managed to snipe the final barracks and earned themselves Mega Creeps. Still, this late into a match, Mega Creeps are survivable. OG are in a great position, but considering how exposed their base is, they are only one bad fight away from elimination. And then, No Tail is caught. OG are forced to fight as Ana is surrounded. Jerox falls next, then Thompson. Ana finds himself on less than half health and surrounded by four heroes. But he is not alone. Anna, can he do it here? To the half he gets the call of his lifetime. Fully forward, he gets the jump on to Exnova, the Ghost Scepter, keeping Exnova fine for now. Anna looking to turn his commitment towards Arme. Thompson comes in with a deafening blast from the side. The EMP finishes Exnova off. He's dead for 110 step. Post the BKB, looks for the core control on 12 point, but F point does get the snowball off in time. Arme looking on top of Jerry's, but Thompson turns. They get the hangs out onto him. He'll get us back into the ball. The BKB's out in time as Arme. Cuts down no chance with the wave for fights the kills. BKB pop, and he's trying to commit, trying to deal with Anna being silenced by the blood right. But the H is falling. The hangs is out. They're going to be able to find themselves challenged. Axe was only picked for three games at the International 2018. Surprisingly, he did quite well in all of them. Given very specific circumstances, Axe could still excel. And more important than his performance was the impact he left on Dota history with one of the most iconic moments of all time. A few months after TI8, patch 7.20 reverted the regeneration rework of 7.07. As part of this, Axe had his health regeneration reduced to 2.75 again. Also included in 7.20 and its letter patches were nerfs to Berserker's Core bonus armor and early counter helix damage, as well as a mild buff to his movement speed. Nerfing Axe like this was very strange. As much as Axe's performance at TI8 was exciting, he was still only picked in 3 games, which doesn't usually warrant nerfs. Luckily for him, patch 7.21 granted him a good boost to his survivability by first increasing his strength gain and then also changing how much health was granted per point of strength. Previously, heroes gained 18 health per point of strength, now they gained 20. Since Axe now had a very respectable strength gain of 3.4, this made a big difference to him. 7.22 then increased his base damage, base armor and base movement speed. Across the last two patches, Axe had become a much more formidable fighter based on his stats alone, regardless of abilities. 7.22 also included another obligatory Aghanim Scepter rework. This time it caused Battlehunger to become a 400 AoE target ability, which allowed Axe to easily hit multiple enemies at once. Because of this, it now only gave half movement speed to Axe when applied to creeps. Aghanim Scepter continued to grant Battlehunger a 30% damage debuff to enemies. At the International 9, Axe once again took on the role of a versatile mercenary. Creep skipping added another option into Axe's already powerful laning repertoire. He could play any lane other than the mid and he would be nearly guaranteed to at least perform fine. Sometimes he destroyed his lane, other times he got bullied but then he could simply pivot into the jungle and find some farm there. While he had lost Iron Talon, the general power creep of the game meant that early jungling had become more feasible again, mostly by virtue of Axe having better stats than before. The only significant innovation of the tournament came from Newbie, who played support Axe in the game against Mineski. This revolved mostly around Axe using Battlehunger to trade hits early with the opposing support while spending significant time in the jungle himself. Support Axe skilled Battlehunger first and focused on spamming it as much as possible during fights. This was surprisingly effective. While Battlehunger was practically worthless when used on carries, especially during the laning stage, Support struggled a lot more when it came to dealing with the ability. 
In big, hectic teamfights, many heroes couldn't find good opportunities to get a kill to shed the effect. In that way, it was much more reliable damage than Counter Helix would have been. Since Axe was a support himself, it was fine for him to focus more on disrupting the enemy supports instead of tanking the big scary carries. And because Axe was Axe, he could still find enough farm to buy his Blink Dagger and that was all he needed. He skipped blade mail during this game as he focused more on his general utility than damage. This wasn't unusual during TI9. Blade mail became significantly less popular although it remained a frequent purchase. It just went from a must buy to a probably should buy. Instead Axe often focused on survivability like Vanguard, Hood of Defiance and BKB to maximize his Berserker's call opportunities. At the International 9, Axe was picked in 32 games, just about 17% of the tournament with a 50% win rate. He was mostly chosen for his laning prowess and his reliability. Even when Axe was doing badly, he was okay. And yeah, he still couldn't do much even when he had a great start, but nobody expected that of him. However, I also believe that he was maybe a bit too safe of a hero choice. Axe was most popular with the worst teams of the tournament. Alliance, Navi and Keen Gaming all played Axe frequently and all of them got knocked out in the first round of the main event. Newbie was the best team to play Axe more than once and they had an 80% win rate with him but they still got knocked out during round 2. At the end of the day, Axe wasn't chosen because of a winner's attitude. He was chosen to play it safe. And Axe certainly wasn't going to put in overtime himself. The International 10 was delayed by a year because of the global pandemic of 2020 and so there are a lot of changes to cover over this two-year period. I will be summarizing. Berserker's Call had its cooldown increased by one second. Battlehunger had its cast range reduced at level 1 but buffed at every other level. Counter Helix had its cooldown reduced to a constant 0.3 seconds and had its chance reduced at early levels. And finally, Cutting Blade had its kill threshold increased and it now dealt damage through spell immunity. Axe also gained 5 movement speed and a set of new, mostly unremarkable talents. Unfortunately for Axe, one of his strategies was deleted in patch 7.27, as lane creeps were changed so that for the first 5 minutes of the game, players could no longer aggro them before they passed their own tier 1 tower. This killed creep skipping, as the creeps would now simply ignore Axe. Axe wasn't the culprit here. His style of creep skipping was actually quite fair as it came with major risk. But there were various strategies that pulled creeps away from their lanes that were incredibly disruptive and largely risk free. Heroes like Lone Druid and Nature's Prophet could use their summons to safely pull creep waves away from the lane and then reposition them into locations that were safer for their own farming purposes. This was nearly impossible to deal with and so it was removed. Axe just happened to be in the crossfire. 7.27 also included a small rework of blade mail. It gained a passive component that always reflected 20 plus 20% 20 of physical attack damage taken. Activating blade mail boosted the physical attack damage reflection to 100% and also gave it 80% spell damage reflection. This meant that blade mail became worse at returning spell damage but significantly better at returning attack based damage. This change was quite beneficial to Axe. There was also a short period where blade mail could be stacked, which led to silly games where players bought 5 blade mails to instantly kill anyone that dared attack them. But this was unintentional and eventually removed. Then in 7.28, his Aghanim Scepter was yet again reworked, losing all of its previous properties. Now it reduced Berserker's Cold cooldown by 3 seconds and made it apply battle hunger to affected units. With a single, well-landed Berserker's Call, Axe could now apply battle hunger to an arbitrary number of enemies at the same time. This became useful because with Aghanim Scepter, battle hunger also started stealing 7 armor for every opponent affected by it, granting it to Axe. Creeps counted for half. Combined, the two effects gave Axe significantly more survivability while also increasing his damage output by a good amount. Battle hunger was a bit of a weird ability. By itself it usually wasn't very impressive as any one single hero could easily find a way to dispel it by killing something. However, with his new Aghanim Scepter, 
Axe was applying a lot more than one battle hunger. And as soon as three or four heroes needed to hunt for a kill, they started hindering each other and so battle hunger became a much more viable tool for dealing damage. That, combined with the lowered Berserker's Coil cooldown, made his new Aghanim Scepter by far the strongest iteration. 7.28 also introduced the Aghanim's Shard. Aghanim's Shard was an item that could be purchased after 20 minutes game time. If purchased, it would be instantly consumed and either enhance existing abilities or grant a new one. For Axe, his Aghanim's Shard allowed him to trigger counter helix off of attacks while also increasing his attack speed by 20. Notably, counter helix triggered this way didn't put the ability on cooldown and worked independently from its regular effect. At first, this ability was unimpressive, but then it was buffed significantly, now granting plus 35 attack speed and a 10% increased chance to trigger counter helix. While implementing this ability, something that at first seemed rather insignificant slipped past Valve. Counter helix could be triggered by illusions, including this new aggressive version. This had always been the case but rarely been useful as illusions would die too quickly to be able to properly use counter helix since they had to be attacked for that. But with the shard, they could trigger it by attacking and when doing so, counter helix dealt full damage. It took a little while to catch on as it was an unusual build but by the time the animator came around, Axe was regularly played as a carry that rushed Manta style. This new strategy split the game into two very distinct sections. Those were before 20 minutes, when Aghanim's shard wasn't available, and after 20 minutes, when he could buy it. Axe would play an early tempo game, relying on Blink Dagger and Vanguard for his usual game plan. Those first 20 minutes were about applying enough pressure that he could then pivot into being a carry. As the 20 minute mark approached, he often put much more emphasis on farming than what we had seen before and he would purchase Manta style as quickly as possible, sometimes even rushing it as his first proper item. Once he had it, he basically became a new hero. He would spam his illusions into lanes to split push and farm and during fights he was more selective when picking where to initiate as he wanted his illusions to live long enough to get a few attacks in because those illusions were scary. Getting pummeled by three constantly spinning axes was way too much for most heroes to handle. Worst of all, they couldn't even fight back, as that would just result in even more counter helixes. And because this build relied entirely on counter helix for damage, Axe didn't need to purchase any additional damage items and he could focus on utility and hero specific counters. The spinning illusion build was widely respected and Axe was a popular hero for the short period that it existed. The Animager was not the first time this build saw play. It had gained notoriety in the months before and by the time of the Animager, the bonus chance the shard provided had already been nerfed to 5%. But the Animager was certainly the most important tournament where this build was used and it seems that it didn't align with Val's vision for the hero. In August 2021, Axe's shard was reworked again. It now caused counter helix to apply a stacking debuff that reduced attack damage by 20% and increased its chance by 10%. No longer could Axe spin proactively. This new shard was… fine. It was meant to increase Axe's survivability, but as always, buying actual defensive items is a much better way to do so than relying on debuffs to reduce opponent's damage. At least Aghanim's shard wasn't particularly expensive and so it saw scattered use. At the International 10, Axe returned to his old role of a strong, reliable laner. However, at this point jungling had been phased out entirely and Axe was forced to play in a traditional dual lane. The problem here wasn't that Axe was bad at dual laning, but that he lost another option. On top of that, Aghanim's shard had been another important level of power creep. Axe's original shard was strong enough that he could use it to compete, but the replacement was mediocre and unimpressive. It didn't even make sense for him, as it reduced the damage opponents dealt and as such also reduced the damage he reflected with blade mail. While many other heroes had gained significant strength, he returned to being run over passively during fights. Axe was only picked twice, but inexplicably one of those came during the fourth game of the grand finals. Team Spirit picked him and then suffered their worst loss of the tournament. 0% win rate, Axe was terrible. With his laning flexibility gone and his laning strength weakened, there were no reasons left to pick him. 
Despite lingering below mediocrity, Axe had been largely unattended to by reworks, unlike many of his contemporaries. This changed in 7.31, although with some caveats. Battle Hunger was changed to physical damage and had its baseline damage reduced, but it started scaling with Axe's armor. The more armor Axe had, the higher Battle Hunger's damage. This allowed him to significantly boost its damage output when using Berserker's Core and also made his Aghanim Scepter much more effective since both the reduced and gained armor mattered for Battle Hunger's damage. Battle Hunger also no longer granted movement speed to Axe and only slowed enemies when they were facing away from him. In turn, its slow was drastically increased to more than double of what it had been. Counter Helix's shard was adjusted to now reduce the damage Axe took, as opposed to the damage his opponents did. This made it work properly with Blade Mail. Most interestingly, Culling Blade was reworked to grant Axe permanent bonus armor for every kill he got with the ability. It was also changed to pure damage and it no longer differentiated between the damage it dealt and its kill threshold. Instead, if an opponent had less health than Culling Blade did damage, then they were instantly killed. Keen listeners among you may have noticed that this is how every ability that does damage works. But I suppose for Axe this counts as something special. He did retain the ability to kill through death protection effects, which was a minor, insubstantial niche, but a niche nonetheless. Cunning Blade also had all of its other numbers weakened at early levels and its damage adjusted to be the same as its previous kill threshold. Then his talents were adjusted to work with his new abilities and that was it. This was his big rework. And apparently it was strong enough to warrant a series of nurse. Over the next few patches his base health regeneration, strength gain and agility gain were reduced. Berserker's Call provided less bonus armor and his Aghanim Shard was also nerfed reducing damage by less. However, Berserker's Call also had its cast point improved and regained its lost armor through a level 10 talent. Battle Hunger also regained its speed boosting property with the other level 10 talent. Finally, Culling Blade's cast range was slightly boosted and Axe's base damage was increased by 3. The International 11 was about laning and Wraith Pact. One of these acts handled quite well, as his laning presence, courtesy of Counter Helix and Battle Hunger, remained substantial. He started incorporating an early vanguard into his item build, which made him easily able to tank most attacks during the laning stage and let him farm big jungle stacks. As an offlaner, he provided a formidable presence that gave many melee heroes a hard time. However, once past laning, Wraith Pact ruined his chances to deal any kind of meaningful damage. He often entered fights only to die after casting a single Berserker's Call. The new Culling Blade and its ability to provide Axe with permanent bonus armor may sound like it would have addressed his long-term survivability issues, but in practice that didn't work out. During PSG LGD vs Team Liquid, Axe was a successful early playmaker who got kills all over the map and gathered multiple Culling Blade stacks. But as PSG LGD started playing defensively during the mid-game, Sai, who was playing the Axe, couldn't find any more opportunities. And so he started to fall behind. This wasn't unusual for an offlane initiator, but those heroes would generally bring significant fighting power that scaled with match length, as their powerful AoE abilities often became game-ending. This couldn't be said for Axe. Team Liquid had the lead for this entire match. But as they entered the late game, it took only 3 fights during which Axe was utterly useless for PSG LGD to turn the tides and claim victory. While Axe's rework had certainly made him more powerful, it hadn't addressed the fundamentally terrible ability that was Culling Blade. And while back in 2016 a hero could be played just fine without an ultimate, in 2022 there was no reason to even try when other characters did have an ultimate and teams could just pick those instead. 5 games, 3 losses, terrible performance all around. Following the International 11, Axe received numerous buffs. First, his base movement speed and the radius of Counter Helix were increased. Then in 7.33, Counter Helix was reworked to no longer be chance based and instead always trigger after Axe was hit a certain number of times. Combined, these changes added a huge amount of reliability to Axe's laning strength, as he could now accurately plan when a Counter Helix would trigger as opposed to having to hope 
like he did before. His Aghidim's shard was also changed to no longer increase proc chance of counter helix and instead it removed its cooldown. 7.33 was also responsible for a funny interaction between Axe and Medusa. In this patch, Medusa was changed to no longer have any natural strength and instead rely entirely on her mana shield for survivability. But this didn't work well against Axe, as it wasn't unusual for the new Medusa to have less than 250 health when Axe hit level 6, which meant he could one-shot kill her with Culling Blade. Even some pro players fell for this. 250 is greater than 230. It is. All right. Well, that means it's a one-shot. Here we go. Thiracho showed himself. He's gonna show. He's gonna oh, get one shot. He's gonna get one shot. Do it. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh that feels it. so good. To see that stupid snake lady get one shot. <laughs> While funny, this didn't last, as Medusa players quickly figured out to buy a bit of early HP when going up against Axe. Then over the next few patches, Berserker's Call had its radius slightly increased, Counter Helix and Culling Blade gained more damage, and Axe lost some agility gain. Along the way, his talents had also been slightly buffed. The International 12 was dominated by its strongest heroes. The gulf between them and anyone below was massive. While Axe's laning presence had gotten even better due to the Counter Helix rework of 7.33, that wasn't where he had needed help. His laning had always been good, and instead he struggled afterwards. As Axe hadn't received buffs in the areas where he needed them, he couldn't compete. His best and most appealing quality was a positive matchup against Bristleback, who was one of the kings of TI-12. Bristleback wanted to be attacked from his backside, where he took reduced damage. Axe could taunt Bristleback and force him to face Axe's team, which then gave them an opportunity to go for the kill. As much as this was theoretically possible, in practice Axe often found himself simply overpowered by Bristleback. Like before, even when Axe was doing well, he was significantly less powerful than other similar heroes. He often couldn't keep fighting after a single initiation as he would take too much damage to jump back in without dying. And of course, the old question remained. Why pick Axe when Primal Beast or Kunkka or Spirit Breaker or Pangalia or Earth Spirit or Santa War Runner or Tusk or many more were available? 5 games, 3 wins, mediocre performance. For the first four years of Dota 2's history, Axe was the worst hero in the game. He was unusably bad, in large part because of a bizarre rule that prevented Counter Helix from dealing damage. During this period, he underwent a variety of changes that all somehow ignored the core issue that prevented Axe from participating in the competitive scene. It took until 2016 for Counter Helix to finally become a worthwhile ability, and with it, Axe made his competitive debut as a powerful laner that smoothed out drafts with his wide range of early game capabilities. Whether it be dual side lanes, solo off lane, early jungling, or something else entirely, Axe could be relied upon to perform well and carry that performance into a reasonable presence throughout the entire game. Axe offered his team a rare sense of stability. But over the years, Dota became more streamlined. Iron Talon was removed, then creep skipping became disallowed and 2-1-2 dual lanes became enforced. The standardization of Dota drastically reduced what a generalist like Axe could do and soon he found himself needing to compete for power. Here he came up short. Axe hadn't received the same blessings that other heroes had. Even his big rework refused to give him a usable ultimate. Axe seems to be forever cursed to be nothing but a laner that is strong but increasingly less so and that is forced to watch power creep pass him by. Across Dota history, Axe has been less than mediocre and unfortunately I don't see that changing anytime soon. Hello friends, thank you very much for watching the story of Axe. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I have to say I wasn't really expecting much of him and he was still a letdown which is 
impressive. But you know who definitely isn't going to be a letdown? That's right, our next hero. It's Earthshaker, the king of stunts. So, I hope you guys are looking forward to that. If you are, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. And don't forget to be back next month. I'll see you then.